So uh, I'm Merle Singer, as was noted. My talk is entitled, I Feel Suffocated, Understandings of Anthropogenic Climate, Ch Climate Turmoil in an Urban Heat Island. And the other uh, collaborators who I'm working with, a graduate student, Jose Hazeman and an undergraduate student here at UConn. And we work in collaboration with a community-based organization in Hartford, Connecticut, Family Life Education, where we recruited participants for the study that I'm gonna to talk to you about. The theme of deconstructing humanity sort of harmonizes in an unfortunate way with the kind of work that I focus on in terms of environmental health issues, which is one of the areas in which I work. And this concept of ACT, or anthropogenic, that is human-caused climate turmoil. And it's getting at the idea that we have terms like climate change, climate global warming, but neither of them quite captures the complexity and the contradictory nature of all of the components of what's going on at the present time. Yes, the planet is heating, but that doesn't mean that the planetary heating is not the cause of extremely bad snowstorms, because under given circumstances, in fact, it is. So when a senator of the United States, who recently wanted to bring a snowball into the Senate, to prove that climate change wasn't happening, he unfortunately just exposed his misunderstanding of climate change. And this term of anthropogenic climate turmoil is to try and get us away from being trapped in any simplistic understanding of what's going on. What's going on is complex, but certainly quite understandable given the array of sciences that are part of the analysis. So that's the, the basis for this term. The idea here is that Earth, as we know it, has limits in terms of being a place that is habitable comfortably by humanity. I was listening to an NPR talk uh, by a space physician, somebody who works on the issues that astronauts face when they go up in space and they, their body begins to deteriorate when they're in space for a long time. Things start breaking down. And his basic point was, we are adapted as a species not to live in the galaxies, not to live everywhere, to live here. Our evolutionary history took place here and we are specifically evolved to live here. We don't do so well other places. So understanding here is critical to us because to the degree that we change here, and that's what, in fact, of course, as you all know, we are doing at a very rapid pace. We are changing Earth into something very different than it was in the past, making it less and less a comfortable place for humanity to live in, physically and otherwise. Research suggests that there, some research have proposed that there are in fact nine different boundaries that could be crossed. These that are, are listed are some of them, you can see them to the degree you can make out that chart on the, the screen. And existing analysis shows we've already crossed four of the nine. Four of the nine barriers that once we cross them all, will successfully make this a place that's not very hospitable, and the deconstructing of humanity proceeds with it all along the way, getting worse and worse, worse as we pass each step. One of the key areas currently being impacted by this, by ACT, by ACT, anthropogenic climate change, are cities. And that has to do with the fact that cities are hotter than the, the suburban and rural areas around them. 
Cities heat up quicker. They absorb heat from the sun. The buildings, the sidewalks, the parking lots, the roads, they all absorb heat and retain it during the day and into the night. And the result is that, and it's particularly noticeable at night, cities are much warmer than the surrounding areas that are not so urban, such urban concentrations. And this phenomenon is known as the heat island effect. Cities, in effect, are a kind of island when it comes to heat, where heat is concentrated. Cities are also a place where we have concentrations of populations that have higher rates of vulnerability in terms of poverty, in terms of aging issues, in terms of a variety of other things that make them at higher risk when cities heat up during summers with heat waves that increasingly are not lasting for brief periods of time, but are enduring for days at a time, hitting higher temperatures, not cooling off at night, not giving human bodies an opportunity to cool off, which is what night provides, even in a heat wave. If the night stays warm, people don't cool off, cool off and their physical system begins to break down as a result. So heat island effect. Specifically, my talk is focused on our research in Hartford, Connecticut, not very far from here, but the largest urban center to Yukon, uh, on people's inner city dwelling people, particularly Latino people's knowledge of climate change, global warming, act, whatever. Uh, are people aware of it? Are they concerned? Is this an issue for them? Or are they so overwhelmed with the other things of life, of just getting by, that they really can't focus on what's happening in the world around them in terms of climate change effects? Certainly we know from reports from the Environmental Protection Agency that places like Hartford have already begun to in experience heat waves at a higher level. The city of Hartford have, has had to set up cooling stations during recent summers where people could go into air conditioned areas uh, inside buildings to get out of the heat. So that already the city has, is facing this problem and it's only going to get worse. What we found is that while overall, that while people are aware of what's happening and we're, we're much more attuned than we thought they might be, there's a lot more going on here that needs to be teased apart, figured out. One of the things we know is that in terms of hospitalization rates, heat stroke, the, these kinds of things are starting to rise in places like Hartford because this is a city with about 125,000 people, disproportionately African American and Latino, disproportionately poor. In essence, a city entrenched in poverty with limited resources because it's cut off from its natural suburbs, which are independent suburbs of the city politically independent. And there are great differences between Hartford and suburbs like West Hartford and Simsbury and whatnot. The participants in our study, recruited from this community-based organization, were 22 individuals who were receiving services from this community, from this community organization, 18 to 59 years of age, limited education for the most part, but many had received at least some high school. As one participant, a 36-year-old woman said, I've completed high school but didn't finish all the way because I, the, I lacked the financial means. I went to the university back in my country. I was unable to continue because I didn't have the necessary funds. And that's a commonly an issue. People have to leave school to try and find some way to make a living. In this talk, I want to focus specifically on three areas of findings, three themes in the, the data. One, participants' worries and uncertainties about climate change. 
the shared sense of not knowing enough and strongly wanting to learn more about climate change, and then feeling excluded from any citywide or other preparatory efforts to prepare them for the changing world in which they live. So the first one of these themes might be termed something like concern wrapped in uncertainty. People are concerned, but they have a lot of questions. They're not confident in their knowledge. Overall, it reflects an attitude that has been found in many studies by other anthropologists and related social scientists that people in the world, in many parts of the world, are beginning to feel like they can't. The world is, the weather in particular, is not as predictable as it used to be. You can't count on what the weather will be like anymore the way you might have in the past. As one participant noted, as quoted here, it's almost as if people feel desperate. Yes, desperate. There are times that they look at the world or we look at the world and it's like as if it was ending and it's desperate and worried and we want to see and, and when we see the drastic changes, the heat, the winds at times that seem out of place, rains when we're not expecting them and then there's other times that we expect rain and it doesn't happen so up there there was a change that did not let rain reach us. Similarly, from another participant, I won't read the whole thing. Yes, of course, global warming is a problem for all of us. For example, we talk about the weather, not knowing whether today is going to be hot or it's going to be cold, et cetera. So people are aware, they express a sense that things are changing, things are getting less predictable, and they are feeling more vulnerable as a consequence. But there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of doubt that they have good information. They feel cut off from a lot of information and really would like to know more. As w one participant said, well, a lot, because all of these changes, I don't know if it's because one develops problems at a certain age. It's like, for example, I never suffered from now allergies, but last year I started having allergies because of the change in the climate. And I don't know if it's related to changes in my body or it's because of the climate. So, Certainly, uncertainty is a part of this general concern. It isn't clear cut. But the overwhelming sense is a, that of precarity, of vulnerability, including especially health vulnerability, including framing their vulnerability in a temporal uh, frame in which as they themselves get older, they will become more vulnerable and they're worried about the world their children will grow up in. And part of this sense of vulnerability is the experience of powerlessness, that they don't have the means to change what is going on around them. Now there's no, it's not that everybody agreed about all the things, there's no single monolithic Latino perspective on what's happening, but it's clear that there's a shared kind of broad sense of uncertainty, doubt, and fear. We even see some of the kind of neighbor blaming that's been described by other people who have looked at environmental health issues where they don't know who to blame for what's happening. Maybe it's because the neighbors don't take care of their trash or some other reason. People point around not knowing who to blame for these changes. The second theme in our findings is that participants might be described as having a sense of not knowing enough and wanting more. So they repeatedly said, we'd like to know more in fact, they asked us, will you tell us more? Will you provide educational sessions to let us understand what's going on around us to help protect us? Also reflected in this comment, but I'm gonna cut it short here. Participants were familiar with getting educational services at an NGO like the one we were working at. And they thought maybe the, the NGOs could provide this service, non-government organizations. 
And they also wanted action, not just knowledge. They wanted to be able to participate in making change. Finally, the final theme that we went into the participants' comments was they've not been invited to participate. They're not being called to the table around preparatory efforts to try and do something about heat islands in their city. And so no one said they'd been involved in any meetings whatsoever. So what we find, and in conclusion, is that there is a greater concern, a clearly expressed ability to talk about the changes, a sense of vulnerability, a desire for more knowledge, a desire for the tools to, to be active, to be empowered, and certainly, these are the kinds of findings that researchers like myself can put to use and are in the process in talking with this uh, NGO of putting together a training program or other kinds of interventions to make their world feel less threatening to them. Thank you. <laughs>